All right, let's start. Good morning, everybody. Uh, as you can see, this room is fully booked. Nobody could sign up for this conference anymore. Uh, but maybe they will come when they have finished the coffee. Uh, we will be talking about the circle and how to get there and where we are and what knowledge we will need to get there. I'm chairing this uh, uh, session. I'm also chair of the scientific committee. My name is Per Mikvits. I work for Lund University, but the Finnish organizers did not want to put a Swedish university on the slide, so I just have to say that. But anyway, uh, I hope we will have a really energetic and, and good uh, session, and, and we will have uh, three excellent, I hope, uh, uh, um, presentations, and after that we will have a discussion, and you will, some of you, not all of you, but some of you will have the chance to ask some questions and interact, and my, uh, my absolute uh, ambition is that we all will learn something new during the session, so that when we walk out we are a bit wiser than we were when we came into the room. And the first person who will help us with this, who will guide us into this learning and to the new will be Mr. Hans Brönings, who is the executive director of the European Environmental Agency. And before he joined them in Copenhagen, he used to be a professor in, uh, in Belgium. Uh, and uh, Hans, the floor is yours. And you can borrow this one, but don't take it with Okay, thank you. Good morning and thanks for uh, inviting us to this uh, session. Uh, at the European Environment Agency, we uh, try to support policymakers with knowledge about European policies and that increasingly includes policies that I call connecting policies. And I think the circular economy is one of those connecting policies. We are located in Copenhagen, for those of you know us, located in Copenhagen, and in essence, we do three things. We gather data, and uh, the monitored data on a number of environmental and climate topics for Europe, uh, and we report them in a qualitative way. Um, secondly, we do what we call integrated assessments. I call it connecting the dots. Uh, how does an evolution in one sphere impact another sphere? For example, the lack of efficiency targets what is the impact on biodiversity, climate change issues. We also are a sort of in-house think tank, you could say, where we bring new scientific ideas to policymakers. This presentation is also the launch of a report, uh, a new report on the circular economy that we're launching today. Uh, and it is a report that takes stock of where we stand today. What do we know about the circular economy? Uh, how are we enabling or not uh, the systemic change that is needed to go from linear to a circular model? How, s how are we governing this type of fundamental transition and how will we monitor circularity in the 21st century? Because that is one of the, the big challenges. This report doesn't fall from the sky. We have been uh, doing reports on circular economy and also on fundamental sustainability transitions for a number of years. Uh, when in 2014 we decided to have a very conscious approach to building a knowledge base around this. And of course this is all based on Europe circular economy policies. Uh, and, and I have to say that where we stand today is also largely thanks to that agenda setting of more than 50 policy interventions that have largely been implemented. So they've set the scene. I think they were really critical in uh, spreading the concept. Uh, I don't think that this building would have hosted the World Circular Economy Forum twice without a strong push from Europe in setting this type of agenda. Yeah. It also fits into an approach that we are following in every five years we come with state and outlook of the environment report and until now focused primarily uh, on analyzing issues, analyzing the problem, but through a set of uh, reports and networks that we've uh, worked with, we are looking more and more, and this will land in our SWR 2020, which we will launch in December, in future-oriented policies that can, and knowledge that can drive the change that is needed. Yeah. 
So we, we call this approach knowledge to action yeah? and not just knowledge to predict the past. Uh? We, we, are, we are very good in predicting the past or marginally good at it. Uh? Um, but we need knowledge, I think, that, that can also drive more future-oriented perspective. I think we need to realize that the circular economy did, did not fall from the sky. Uh, as a re it is a response to something. And I think the something is based on, I think, the connection between those three things. Uh, we all know the IPCC work, of course, in this uh, remium, the one and a half degree report, the recent report on sea level rise. So we know this is a serious business. And we also know that the difference between a two degree world and a one and a half degree world is much larger than we thought three, four or five years ago. That's one driving knowledge component. The other one is the IP best support uh, the, on biodiversity and ecosystems, uh, where we talk about th the next great extinction, uh, one million species that we have lost, and the idea that we could be part of the next one million uh, if we don't watch out. You know? And then, of course, we've got, uh, and, and that the lesser known uh, panel, the International Resources Panel, which talks about unsustainable resource use. And in many ways, this goes to the heart of the matter because those resources are, of course, used in production and consumption systems. And the two other ones talk about what we used to call externalities. By the way, it's a term I think we should get rid of because the idea that the environment and climate are an externality is one of the problems, I think, in our thinking. They're not an externality. They are the boundary condition to say the least, and you could say they are the foundational natural capital on which everything else is built. So the idea of externality may have served the purpose, but I think we should move beyond that. Yeah. Okay, so what do these reports say? Three things. First of all, urgent action is needed. Yeah. Windows are closing uh, to, to really tackle issues. Secondly, we are already in tipping points. And I think this is rather critical. And thirdly, they are interconnected. So we need systemic responses. And I think the circular economy is one of the ideas that is one of these systemic uh, responses. Now, if we talk about systemic responses, we need to reflect on what those systems are. And as the Environment Agency, we focus on three core systems where we have policies that drive change. One is the energy system, the other one is uh, the transport and mobility, the third one is the food system. They are interconnected, yeah? They are interconnected in their policy approaches increasingly, but they are interconnected, I would also say, in potential failure. If we fail on tackling one of them, we will probably also fail in the other two, yeah? So we need, to, we need to reflect on the fundamental challenges that, that connect them. Uh, as you can tell, we have to focus not only on technology and policy, but also on an, a number of issues that connect uh, these systems. Another critical element of systemic change is, of course, that there is no silver bullet. Yeah? The, it's not one type of innovation that is needed. It will be a multitude of innovations that go in the same direction in a very conscious way. This is much more than mainstreaming, because mainstreaming de facto often means that people keep doing what they do, but in their organization they add a small group that then does the mainstreaming. Yeah? That is not what we need. We need a fundamental paradigm shift into what it is we are doing that runs across things. So, uh, that's, that's one idea. The other idea, and the line is not there, is that there needs to be coherency with other dominant policies. So if, if you have a number of innovations going in the right direction, you cannot all of a sudden have a big policy that goes in the opposite direction. Uh, a classic example are countries that invest in uh, electrification of buses in cities, but then through the tax system, promote uh, company cars at a level that is a times higher than what they are investing in the city. It doesn't make sense. Yeah? So 
it's, it's, it goes to a fundamental shift in what we are doing. One of the advantages of using a paradigm of um, transition is that it is inherently optimistic. I mean, the curve is optimistic because you go to something that is better and higher. The words are optimistic. Experimentation, this is good. It's stimulating, curiosity, yeah. Acceleration of that innovation, institutionalization, and then we get stability at a high level of sustainability. I think it's good that we have that sort of vision and on what we can do, but at the same time, we think that there should be more attention for what we should stop doing. In many ways, we have been optimizing systems through policies that are inherently unsustainable. We should stop doing that. That means that we will see some destabilization. Uh, vested interests will feel the pressure of this new paradigm. Will they fit in it or not? How long will they fight it? Yeah. We will see breakdown of certain of the old technologies and maybe even industries. Yeah. And the example I always use is my own city in Belgium. There is a wagon maker street. There is not a wagon maker to be seen today. That was 17th and 18th century. Yet the economy didn't collapse. Society didn't collapse. We moved on. Yeah. That is part of the evolution as well. And then we will need to phase out things. So what will we need to stop doing, I think, requires more attention than what we generally do. Now, on to the circular economy proper. But I thought it was important to frame what, it, what sort of thinking it belongs to. Yeah, it's, it's not a, an isolated Is We see a number of innovations that we've looked at with the agency that, that can contribute to circularity or not. Yeah? These uh, increasingly complex products probably are important to uh, circularity. Yeah? And there are a number of other innovations that are probably positive. Yeah? Modular uh, design, the sharing economy, uh, product services that are emerging everywhere. Those are things that probably can have a, a, a really positive impact on uh, resource efficiency and circularity. And there are those that are still unclear, like home delivery services. With, if you can use them for reverse logistics in an urban environment, they could have a, a positive role. The Internet of Things, uh, 3D printing, um, recycling uh, markets, uh, where the issues are more related to toxicity, to chemicals in products. So there are, there are of issues that are uh, out there. And we think, and this is a complicated graph, so I, in the interest of time, I will not dive into it, but many of these things could work if. And if is not about technology most of the time. The if is about governance. The if is about enabling legal frameworks. The if is about product norms. The if is about tax systems that are uh, connected to this transition. The if is connected to uh, market structure. That is where the if is located. So the idea that it will all be just a technology drive, I think uh, from a societal perspective is a rather naive uh, proposition. So we strongly believe that there is a need for a clear governance framework, developing policies because they can stimulate innovation, social innovation, business innovation, technological innovation, and they frame how fast and in what direction a lot of these things will go. Yeah? What we monitor, and everybody knows of course this, uh, this circle, what we monitor today it's mainly the input in energy, the input in raw materials, and uh, the output in water. That's where we have a system of monitoring and statistics. Yeah. This has been developing under the circular economy package. Uh, Europe came with uh, 10 indicators that are sort of the core set of indicators. They are an improvement over what we had, but what they don't do is monitor on the inside, where the real circularity over time will take place. They don't monitor on the reuse, the repair, 
the remanufacturing, the actual keeping of the material resources into the economic system, not at a megaton level, but at the level of are we keeping this type of material in the value chain over time. So we need to find systems over time that can improve what we have developed until now. And that means in our uh, idea that we need to come with better data on circularity because it's largely lacking at the level of very well-defined material flows, not at the macro level. Yeah. We need to uh, make data that is available already more available to the public. Life cycle analysis, open source global life cycle analysis database, uh, more clarity about methods, also the uncertainties in that, and also using new technologies for traceability, for example. Uh, we can tag materials, we can use blockchain methods, we can use all sorts of methods to innovate in monitoring this. And that should lead to a more trusted and verified system. In climate, we would call that MRV, Monitoring, Reporting and Verification. Yeah? How do we think of an MRV system that is fit for purpose uh, here? And that can then lead financial decisions, policy decisions, business decisions, but also consumer and citizen decisions, uh, and lead into corporate strategies, policies and financial decisions. Uh, so, this is a type of system we are trying to stimulate, at least in its concepts, in the report that we did. We also think it's uh, critical that uh, the sustainable finance initiative in Europe, and it's often those who finance step from laboratory to the value of death, uh, as they uh, in innovation uh, and technology breakthrough, that those who finance that and the further breakthrough, that they take this into account. There is a tendency in the last year that not only is climate driving the discourse, but there is also a bit of climate uh, away investments in other parts of this agenda. And I think it's critical that in the sustainable finance uh, initiative in Europe, there is, a, there is a clear role also for natural capital or circular economy. I think that is absolutely uh, critical. One of the, the elements that we see emerging uh, is that uh, this is part of a broader framework of policies which you could call macro-integrated policies that are driven not by a single target and a single date, but by a package of policies that, are, that connect directorate generals in the Brussels speak you could say sectors of the economy if you look at uh, society and that that belong together uh, you've got the energy union with which links climate to energy discussions bioeconomy the bioeconomy is clearly a link with natural capital so these th now do they stream together i think that is the agenda that is set by the von der Leyen commission the green deal is actually connecting these under an umbrella uh, that is uh, at the highest political level. Yeah. I think what is, what is critical is that uh, we understand that the circular economy uh, I think has been put on the table as a concept that is by now rather well known, although we're in a bubble, we shouldn't overestimate that. It is a, a, a concept that should not be looked at as disconnected from the two big natural challenges, climate change and biodiversity loss. It is in fact underlying driver because it goes to production and consumption systems uh, and that the real debate is not necessarily resource efficiency because of shortages or security. The real debate is resource efficiency because of the impact. And I will end in my last six seconds by saying Let's move beyond this thing that this impact is an externality. Increasingly, it is the fundamental threat that we are facing. And so it's not an externality. It is the fundamental boundary condition that we will need to live by in the 21st century. Thank you.
Okay, thank you very much, Hans. That was a great start for this morning. And you kept it well in your time, and you yep. gave back this machine, so you did everything that you should. You even launched the report. Good start. <laughs> All right, now we will have the speaker, uh, Mariano uh, Tellini from Italy, an economist. And let's see what you have to offer you, uh, offer us. And you can borrow this one, even Thank if you, you will much. start with uh, video. Yes, and please, give definitely. it the time, otherwise I will take you off stage. Absolutely. Thank Good. you. Today, a train is parked for 92% of, of its lifetime. Offices and workplaces are used less than 50% of its time. More than 30% of food production is wasted along the supply chain. See a future where, by 2050, global will grow by more than 2 billion. And the oceans will be fish by volume. We need to read industrial ecosystems. Switching to a normative model. The deep development of finite resources. Today, thanks to the activities of our innovation center, the challenges of circular economy, which is a new paradigm for social development, restorative and regenerative design. Since 2015, we're the financial services global partner of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, the most relevant player promoting transition towards circular economy, and we're exploring new business applications in collaboration with our partners. Finance plays a key role in supporting investments for the business models in circular ones by rethinking the approach to risk and new creation. That's why a circular economy is a matter of strategic innovation, not just sustainability. This is an amazing collective journey. Welcome on board. Everybody and uh, thanks for hosting us. I do thank, as a European citizen, the Finnish government for hosting such important event. I present myself. I have the privilege of working at the Innovation Center of Intesa San Paolo, a company fully devoted to innovation pertaining to the most, one of the most stable financial institutions in Europe today. That is our, I mean, we call it skyscraper. It's only the first uh, 34 floors, but the price is pretty high, is in Turin. And from that floor, we do have a clear view on what the future can be for us and for our clients. What is the vision of the Intesa San Paolo Innovation Center of helping to transform the Italian economy towards a driven and a circular economy approach? And we want to do this because technology can be good or bad. It really depends on how you deploy it. And so we decided that, of course, big data Neuroscience, artificial intelligence are crucial only and only if they can somehow gear to make a positive impact. In Plaza San Paolo today is aiming to become one of the first global positive impact banks in the world. Uh, you know this better than myself. I just want to point out that, as the video said, basically saying already everything, we are talking about something which is not, again, some how in provocative way, we are not talking about sustainability. We are talking about resign. I just had the chance to see that the plastic caps outside here for the water are compostable. And this is a very, very good thing. But usually, this is not the case. And so again, provocatively, but to be I mean, constructive, why we want to say that we are not talking about sustainability is because we recycle something in this case, plastic, at the largest stage. Of course, it's something which is correct, which is commandable to do, but we are not solving the problem. Because at the beginning, basically, such plastic today, what you use, has not been designed to be compostable. And so in order to redesign, you need investments, you need a systemic approach, you need a different approach in culture. That's why for us, circular economy, before even being something which is related crucially to the environmental agenda, it's more important to keep companies sustainable and profitable.
profitable over the long term. It's a matter of strategic innovation in business models. Why a financial institution is looking at circular economy? Because as the, show, the, the video showed, we are the financial service global partner of the LMK Foundation. So we do believe in the definition that they've been sharing with the community, which basically says the coupling the economic and social development from the exploitation of finite natural resources. So, for a financial institution, looking at linear companies means looking possibly, potentially, to riskier companies in the medium long term. That's why for us, circular economy can become a de-risking factor for our economies. This is the pictures that has been taken on 28 January this year in Milan. Our CEO, Mr. Carlo Messina, the CEO of the Alicante Foundation, Bob Capito, chairman of BlackRock. We hold this day usually talking about what the bank has been doing. This year we held that on a specific issue about why more banks should embrace the circular economy concept. Because of course it's providing financial institutions with an opportunity to redesign their approach, but more importantly, it's somehow de-risking, as I was anticipating, the perspective from which financiers are looking at business. In the previous slides from the European agency, we saw that finance can be still today seen as a barrier for financing. This is somehow true, even if many, many times we do appreciate the fact that companies are not fully understanding what the potential of shifting towards a more circular business models are. Take, for example, the cultural approach. We know by statistics that the car stays parked 92% of its lifetime in Europe. Well, in Italy, if you switch to the TV or radio, you are bombarded with commercials that push you to go to the auto dealer in the weekend to buy the latest car. This is the linear model within which we are immersed. It's not finance, the barrier, it's culture. So here we are. We are the only bank today being financial service global partner of such an amazing institution. And when I met with Ellen in 2015, I got struck by her approach to nature. She said, nature is circular. Why economy has to be linear? And this is profound true. So we started the journey with them. We understood that today, business can be a force for good. I do recall myself times where new generations, today millennials or Z generations, were somehow pretty against multinational and corporations some years back. Today, this is pretty different. Today, young generations do appreciate the fact that companies and big multinationals do exist to the conditions that they are able to create positive impact. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation is a non-profit organization, but to me, the most important lesson that I'm learning working with them is that they want to create a new generation of thinkers, just as I was anticipating. This is a matter of strategic innovation, but also cultural alignment. And so <clears throat> the LMA Cato Foundation has two main objectives that I want to sum up with two numbers. One, by 2025, they want to reach out to one billion people with the message of circular economy, which is well beyond the European borders. By 2025, they want to reach out to 80 million designers across the globe, so to make sure that they are busy working on circular economy principles. These two numbers give to me the scale of the potential that this topic does have, starting from Europe, having in Europe the place birth for a new economic model for development. But again, our friends at the foundation said, look, designers across the globe were very depressed because when they looked at what they would do, they understood that everything was already designed. Thanks to the circular economy approach, every designer 
does have an opportunity to redesign everything. We see at the major tables driving the conversation about what circular economy can be. Of course, in this fashion, as we know it, circular economy has been uh, portrayed by Ellen McCarthy at the World Economic Forum in 2014. We are in talks, of course, with major institutions. Maybe it's singular to see that uh, we're talking to the Central Bank of the United Arab Emirates. They have been understanding the potential implications, positive implications, that from a regulatory perspective, circular economy may have on the financial industry. That's why they urge us to talk also to the Ministry of the Economic Affairs, because they understand what the potential is, what the crucial role financial services can play in such an acceleration. I want to talk for a second about Milan. Milan is the financial capital of Italy. But as you know, we host there the Design Week, the Fashion Weeks, well, stay tuned because Milan is supposed to become one of the capital for design and for circular over the next years. And you can be sure that our ambition is also to host Milan Olympics 2026 in a circular fashion. We have been talking about this through a sort of journey that we at the bank have been undertaking with the chief economist and also our chief financial officer, understanding that for an organization of 90,000 people like we are, it's crucial to understand at a very basic level what circular economy is. And that's why I want to reinforce the concept that again, today this topic is really aligned with an environmental agenda, with climate change discourse, but paradoxically, we are not taking this from an environmental perspective. We are taking this from business model and from financial consideration perspective, so that then, by design, of course, you are also creating positive impact from an environmental social standpoint. But that's not the driver. Because otherwise, sustainability has been tremendously important in achieving what we did so far, but today is not sufficient anymore. And actually, when you do talk about sustainability, people tend to get disengaged. There are statistics and surveys that are telling us that the more we keep talking about sustainability, the more we don't reach the target. Back last year, Sir John Elkington in London hosted an interesting event where he said, look, he said, we created the triple bottom line definition, and it was in reality himself 25 years ago. Well, last year, again, he wrote an article for the Harvard Business Review where he said, failed, not just in the ambition, of course, but in the execution, because sustainability today is much more related to a sort of accounting sort of approach. It's more related to making sure that we do have the right papers in place, but nothing does change the business model or in the business conduct of the corporate across the world. And so that's why if you look at the shooting day, you can realize that today being sustainable is not enough anymore. With the Emma Carter Foundation approach and support, we wanted to make sure that we worked. We made sure that our strategic plan 2018 2021 does have 5 billion euros credit facility in place for supporting projects in the circular economy. What is circular economy is not very well defined yet. Standards are required. Still, we want to make sure that we are not supporting just solar panels or wind farms, which of course are mandatory, are important, but we want to make sure that our, they are combined with innovation, with innovative business model, and with innovative technologies that do create positive impact going forward. For that reason, we also sign an additional memorandum understanding and agreement with the European Investment Bank to top our 5 billion euros with other 250 million for SMEs working in the economy transition. We also created the first circular economy lab, is in Milan, as anticipated, is our sort of capital for design. We want to make sure that that becomes the hub for dissemination of culture about circular economy. We have been working with one of the best universities there, Bocconi University is driving a research that is now academically 
proven, we want to demonstrate what we have been trying to understand, which basically says going circular may become a sense of being less risky from a financial standpoint. This is what we do. We do, of course, as anticipated at the first slide, in the open innovation framework. We do work with startups. As a bank, we truly understand the risk of startups and the opportunities of them. But then we do recognize that for us, it's important to create a market for startups. That's why we want to dialogue with them. We want to understand them. We nurture them. We also somehow make sure that we do have acceleration programs for them. However, we do work with SMEs and corporates. So by financing them, by understanding their business models, we can be able to create a market for the startups. And then we create an investment company, venture, an Evafin venture, which is devoted specifically to invest in circular economy companies. We want to make sure that the Italian creativity does play a role in acceleration of the circular economy. But we do this in a very specific way. Intesa San Paolo does have long-term relationships with its clients and actually does work with them along their value chain. That's why we do believe that our support to the transition may really uh, advance the systemic transition and also position the financial industry to make sure that we become one of the best allies for this rather than a barrier. We have been, in closing, supporting the first master in bio and circular economy in Italy. We are launching an MBA with business uh, school and uh, universities. We train our workforce. More than 50,000 of our colleagues have been exposed to those concepts. We want to make sure that our government is listening and is learning about this journey. And you can be sure that Italy at least can be seen as one of the partners for the next European Commission to work on this topic, also from a national standpoint agenda. I do thank you for your attention. Done. Please join us. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you very much. We're doing great. We're still on time. We had a second presentation. Very interesting to have also a banker in the room. Is it okay to call your banker? <laughs> it is. No okay, worries. good. And then uh, finally, we'll have uh, the, the third speaker. Uh, we'll have Lena Arika Stenros. Uh, she is an associate professor in industrial management at Tampere University. You can borrow this too. Thanks. Coming from a Technological side, you can use yeah, it, I, I hope. Yeah, yeah. And, and she will bring us the researcher's perspective of these issues. The floor is yours. Yes. Thank you, dear colleagues. Uh, nice to be here uh, to discuss with you. Uh, the perspective I bring in into this discussion is academic research and all that knowledge and knowledge-based tools that we can develop from academic research. Um, I bring the perspective of circular economic catalysts um, uh, that we are uh, studying in a big uh, multidisciplinary consortium. Uh, as a researcher, I come from Tampere University and sustainability and circular economy are a key research area there. But I also represent the GICAT 2025 consortium uh, that is a really large, extensive uh, 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 group of researchers. We are over 40 researchers covering uh, almost 10 disciplines. We are from six different universities, and academic is funding our um, attempts to analyze circular economic catalysts. And we are doing this research work with um, many stakeholders. We are collaborating with companies, with cities, uh, with uh, associations, with ministries. And our aim is to uh, analyze those catalysts that drive the change. Uh, we all know what circular economy is. It's about recycling materials, it's reusing components, products, it's uh, reducing material via sharing, via using services instead of, of products. And what we need for, for this change is that we need to innovate, we need to develop technologies, 
uh, we need to, to develop businesses and we also need to change my, our mind. And we also know that uh, the change towards circular economies is a tough case. It's a paradigm shift, like Hans said. It's, it's, it's not an easy one. Uh, circular economy transition uh, is inherently difficult because it's a one type of society technical uh, transition. And in, in, by nature, they are difficult. They, they will take decades. Uh, they are difficult because they concern this kind of socio-technological transition. It concerns really wide system and its actors concurrently. And that's the reason I, that it doesn't happen uh, fast. And you all agree that, that there are also opportunities. There is a push to change, but when it comes to circular economy transition, there are also many uh, critical challenges, like uh, virtual materials, they are cheaper, the shift would change, uh, competition between branches, uh, between companies, between industries, between nations. So, so it's, it's disturbing the status quo. So it's, it's, it's rather clear that it, it's not an uh, easy one to, to make. And finally, the, and probably the most tricky part is that we need to change our uh, behavior, our thinking, our decision-making criteria. And I think that's the, the most uh, difficult one to change. But even though the transition is, is difficult and we are facing these challenges, we, can also, we are also evidencing that progression is, is happening in the field. I, I have some examples here from our research. These are companies and, and cities uh, that are already implementing circular economy practices. For example, here we have two company cases. A large one, Neste. It's a Finnish company that is a large oil refining company. Uh, formerly, its, it's focus uh, has been in fossile based fuels, but now, um, within around 10 years, its strategic focus has shifted from fossil based business to bio-based renewable uh, business. They are now uh, one of the leading, leading branches. Uh, they produce beautiful from re renewable uh, raw materials like, like waste grease. So here we have one example where a large company has really changed its strategy from fossils to more renewable business. Then another example, uh, NetSet. It's a startup. It, it has been going around a year and, and, and it's operating in the construction industry. Uh, what it, its business is about is it's, it's reducing construction waste. So, so that they are uh, gathering uh, surplus materials, unused construction materials from construction sites, and then they are selling them in web shops and web shop and, and outlet. So these are two examples that are, I mean, of course, there are, there are hundreds of, of new uh, businesses, new branches, but, but still these, these two examples can, can easily show that there are change happening in the field. And the same change is happening among cities. For example, six major city regions in Finland are now trying to turn their practices more sustainable. They are trying to be more resource efficient. Uh, efficient. Uh, for example, uh, six circular economy um, hubs in cities, Ekomo in Helsinki metropolitan area, Topin Puisto in Turku, Tolme, uh, Kolmenkulma Taraste and Hirvanta in Tamere area, and Ruskonniittu in Oulu. 
they are all uh, developing their strategy, how they can turn their practices from managing waste to managing resource flows. And, and for this, they are for clearing this knowledge, for developing this knowledge, these, um, these hubs are collaborating. And another example from these six uh, city regions is um, Brojek Circle, where these, these cities, they aim to enhance how, they, how the cities can utilize large volume masses in, in urban city districts. These masses can be ash, for example, from waste incineration plants. It can be clay. Uh, it can be zero fiber, for example, in in, in um, dump area. They saw in the bottom of lake there are million um, tons of of, of uh, zero fiber that is a side stream from from pulp industry. So how to manage this kind of large volume masses in sustainable way, keeping business perspective in mind, but also environmentally wise. And then one example where uh, companies and city can collaborate. This is also something that we will, we will need when we are aiming to, to accelerate the change. We need to put cities and companies to, to collaborate. This example is from uh, Pirama region, where the, uh, the city of Nokia, uh, it's a, um, it's a, it has been... Um, it has um, cooperated with um, um, many companies that they are aiming to create a new industrial ecosystem, industrial symbi symbiosis that would allow resource flows and, and symbiosis. This has been happened in public-private collaboration. It's, it's, it's ongoing, it's, it's progressing all the time. So we have these uh, good examples. So the question is that what we can then learn from these forerunner cases, what we can learn from these change makers. Uh, in our research consortium, we are arguing that we should look this really closely, these forerunners, and analyze what are the catalysts that has enabled them to change. So we are taking a catalyst approach. We are taking this over a barrier approach. We don't benefit so much if we analyze barriers because we know that this is difficult transition. So we should look on the, those drivers that really enable making the change. So, so we are looking at the catalysts. And with the catalyst, uh, we refer to different kind of means and, and, and mechanisms that enable the, the change. And here we have a um, figure that illustrates our thinking. So here is the um, innovation, the idea, the innovation ecosystem where we have the idea, but in order to make circular economy business, in order to implement it, we should get there. And we argue that the catalysts are helping us to realize this transition. And, but we need really different kind of catalysts. We need uh, technology, yes. We have heard that there are really different kind of technologies that, that enable processing materials or, or digital technology. But we also need... Uh, new practices in regulation, we need uh, language catalysts, we need new kind of business models and, and other kind of catalysts. We need this change, we need to manage change. So, so there are also management-related organization-related catalysts. Then there are political policy catalysts and also images, visual images that drive the change. And important also are also different kind of stakeholders and actors who realize the change and they can use catalysts to, to enable this transition, the shift, the paradigm shift, like, like Hans told.
told us. If we zoom in these uh, catalysts, uh, we will see the diversity. Technology and innovation has been uh, on the table uh, yesterday, and, and, and I, I guess that also today it is uh, the most um, often referred catalyst. But I would like to, to highlight that there are also other catalysts like, like more cultural issues like language and, and images. But if we go through these uh, diverse catalysts, we can easily see that there are, the, the, we can see the variety and we need all these different kind of catalysts. Technology catalysts, they concern material and process technologies, they are digital technologies, business catalysts, they are business models, they are different kind of partnerships, uh, collaboration, financing, uh, commercialization paths, organization and leadership, it's about managing the change, what kind of innovation culture there is in, in, in company. Regulation, like national law, EU law, sustainable policy, how, um, for example, cities, what kind of policies they, they have, what kind of uh, strategies they have for sustainability. Then language, what kind of words we use, what kind of terms we have how we encourage, what kind of discourse we use, how we speak about uh, circular economy, for example, how we encourage uh, people to act. Then visual arts images, for example, in social media, they has been really um, um, challenging, um, change-making pictures, visual images that, ha that are pushing us to change. And then stakeholder engagement, how we engage stakeholders in, in this moment. And when we are applying this, this catalyst approach back to, the, to the, these cases, uh, these cases, uh, we, have been, uh, we have been analyzing them from research perspective, and if we put now some catalysts uh, or some catalysts um, when it comes to these cases. For example, in Este case, uh, yes, these technological catalysts. Uh, Neste is really uh, um, competent in turning different kind of waste materials to high level uh, fuel. They have the technological competence, they have technological innovation, they are good in technology. So clearly that they have technological catalyst. But it's not all that is needed. For they are also needing, or do they have had uh, management-related catalysts? When we have been interviewing the top management of Neste, they often, the top management say that they have been allowed to do things differently. They probably, they are not pushed to do different, they have been allowed to do differently, to, to make new kind of decisions. And then communications and strategy catalysts, that is really clear in this case. For example, 10 years ago, they were in the oil, and they, they dropped the oil uh, from the, the, the company name to implement, to manifest their new strategy, that they are moving from oil business the fossil business to more renewable business. And then to Netlet case, this is my star startup. I think the key actors of the company are, are in, the, in the same picture. Very nice. And they are, uh, they are good in networking. They, they, have, they have been able to create the new value chains with, with, with uh, construction uh, players, the, the, the large ones, they have been really rapid and, and fluent in developing their business model. So, so they are, um, their business is increasing step by step. So once again, we have some catalysts that have drive their business. So I'm arguing that how, how we can move 
forward in the cir circular economy transition, we are really needing these catalysts. We need more knowledge on, on this kind of different catalyst. We need more knowledge on technology catalyst, but we need also uh, knowledge on the other catalysts, more cultural catalysts like language that uh, encourage us to act differently. We need wording. Uh, we need images that provoke change. We need regulation that enables, that allows us to change the system. We need uh, new business models because the business needs to be profitable, like your presentation uh, showed. Uh, we need um, uh, advice how to manage change towards circular economy. So, so uh, I'm arguing that we need to know the catalyst, we need to identify them, and we can also use this knowledge to drive the change. And this knowledge can be done not only by researchers, but uh, jointly in collaboration between researchers and industry actors, between researchers and decision makers. So, so I hope that, that uh, or actually I, I invite you to, to join the uh, Circular Economic Catalyst um, movement and research you are very welcome to our workshops and, and collaborate with us. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much, and please sit down, and all right, everybody has been spot on time. We have half an hour for, for discussions, and that's great, because I have a lot of tricky questions for you, but um, relax a while, because now a fourth person will join us on the stage, uh, that is Arnaldas uh, Milukas. You work for the, as a head of you, the executive uh, agency for small and medium uh, en enterprises, and you also help the commission with a lot of things, with yes. the horizon and life and things like that. Yes, indeed. Okay, good. I will start with you. Uh, because when I was preparing for this, uh, uh, this um, conference, I asked my colleagues in Lund that if I have one sentence, what is the main message that I should say uh, at this conference? And, and uh, several of them said that we need to have a focus, to shift the focus from individual technologies to more on, on the social elements uh, of the circular economy. So you, when you are helping the Commission with the Horizon 2020, um, do you think that there is focus also on the social elements, and the business models and the governance, or is the focus, is this critique that you have from a lot of researchers that the focus is still that we are too technocratic? Is there any merit to that? Yes, uh, so thank you. Thank you, Per, and uh, good, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm very pleased uh, to be uh, here and to take uh, part in this panel discussion dedicated, you know, to the systemic change to circular economy at different uh, sectors and operational levels here in Helsinki. And we know that Finland has always been a, a front runner in driving uh, breakthrough innovations. It adopted uh, the first world circular uh, uh, economy roadmap in 2016, which aims at a global leader by creating sustainable well-being with a successful carbon neutral uh, economy over the next years. And uh, this is the reason why I think there is no better venue uh, than the Finland Hall for this event, because I think it always started here two years ago with the World Circular Economy Forum, launched by CITRA, who is a help of uh, different uh, uh, EU services, including uh, my service, EASMA, Executive Agency for Small and Medium Enterprises, but of course other services as well. And we know that, of course, a circular economy is a core part of uh, Finland presidency of the European uh, Union agenda. So, uh, speaking about the, uh, let's say, uh, funding uh, programs and how they support and uh, what their focus, uh, let's say, on. Uh, of course, you know, uh, no one doubts, I think, that uh, the research and innovation uh, is playing key role for the development of the circular economy. And of course, we need to invest more uh, to deliver circular economy. And uh, of course, let's say, in addition to exploring, testing, and validating new technologies, 
as a kind of Perol had mentioned, we need as well a new business and governance models and as well new uh, digital uh, solutions. I think we need to, to look how we can harvest on all these, you know, artificial, let's say, intelligence and, and big data technologies. And uh, uh, let's say, um, then maybe I would like to, uh, let's say, to uh, share as well some uh, examples uh, and contributions of the uh, project that we manage, you know, in IASME. And of course, the projects, uh, let's say, usually they are called innovation act actions because they have a strong focus on a demonstration of systemic approaches, uh, including for the creation of the new uh, business models and, of course, with the engagement of the all uh, relevant uh, stakeholders. And uh, uh, let's say to, to give examples, of our calls in the World Program 2020 which I think uh, will open, uh, open very soon, like in one month's time. We have a call called Industry 2020 in the circular economy. There will be 650 million uh, dedicated uh, uh, to leverage eco-innovative approaches for circular economy, uh, for water use, uh, production chains, of a solution as well, which will enhance economic as well uh, environmental performance of the system. Uh, as well, in the in the work program of 2018-20, in total around 940 million has been allocated uh, uh, for the call connecting economic and environmental gains uh, for the circular economy. And again, the focus of, of, of actions here is on the new business models, on services uh, in uh, uh, key economic uh, uh, sectors, mostly sectors which use more materials like automotive, you know, building, white goods, uh, water technologies. Another program that has been mentioned is, is a live program, is a, is a program uh, dedicated uh, to, let's say, to support EU environmental policies and as well they support the uh, circular economy significantly. Uh, from uh, 1992, I think they had more than 700 projects with uh, more than 1 billion uh, in, uh, investment. And uh, under the current live program 2014, they have 100 projects running uh, with uh, more budget of more than 130 million. So speaking now about the examples uh, of the Horizon 2020. We need Six to get a discussion going. You can't give a speech. A little bit, but of course One I'm minute. interested. One now. minute, sir. Oh, okay. Just uh, so I then I will uh, skip, uh, let's say, uh, examples, but I thought they, they could be relevant, you know, and <laughs> then, you know, uh, uh, I can just then maybe uh, mention, let's say, uh, uh, for, let's say, uh, what, uh, what would be maybe needed, you know, uh, uh, for the, let's say, um, what kind of recommendations uh, we, we, we can make, you know, uh, is uh, for, 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 let's say, it's about the uh, promoting interdisciplinary research and collaboration uh, while trying to combine insights from the various disciplines. Uh, uh, that means environmental engineering sciences, but as well behavioral sciences and uh, from policy making to advance and to solve uh, problems more efficiently. And I think there was a very good concrete example presented uh, previously by Lina about the uh, circularity hubs about this uh, industrial symbiosis uh, where, uh, let's say, it's possible to engage, you know, uh, traditionally separate industry in more kind of collective approach, uh, how they physically exchange uh, materials, energy, water, uh, and by, by product. And this, I think, is a concept allows of more sustainable way of using resources and, of course, contribute significantly towards a circular uh, economy. And uh, of course, here yeah, again, it's, it's not easily, I think, applicable. You need certain certain enabling factors, you know, like even geographical proximity or as well this uh, will to collaborate and, and to, 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 to work in synergetic. Okay, manner. thank yes. you very much. Let's move on. Let's get some interactions here. I ask you for, for a bit of shorter statements, Hans. You listen now to the two other speakers. You started out with the urgency, 
IPCC, IPBS, uh, the International uh, uh, Resource Panel, they all say we need to act. Five years ago, we have been talking for five, for ten years about the circular economy. Five years ago, a lot of us said that we need more experimentation. Now we have all these good cases, but we have no acceleration. We don't see really that much progress. What should we do? What would be key messages now in Brussels and somewhere? What should we actually do to get from experiments to somewhere else? To get these catalyzers kicking in more, more efficiently? What would you say? Well, first of all, I think the political message about uh, doing things differently has been given by the new commission. It's the first time in the, the European institutions that the, the work program for the Commission, and it takes the initiative on new legislation, that is the role of the Commission, is no longer only about growth and jobs, or if they want to do it differently, uh, jobs and growth, yeah? Uh, it is now about that, but they've put a boundary condition over it. Of course it's about society and the economy, but in the 21st century we have to do it differently. That is the meaning of this von der Leyen agenda. We've got serious issues, they are the boundary condition, and Europe needs to lead in economic and social development within those conditions. So that, I think, is a translation of this sense of urgency. It now needs to happen. The other thing that needs to happen is that I, I understand the language of return on investment uh, is the driver, not the environment. Well, let's assume we would not make a profit. Would we then not save what there is to save? That is the critical question we need to ask, because the return on investment is for one factor of production for capital at this moment. Yeah? And we all took economics 101, and it says there are three factors of production, capital, labor, and what we used to call land, its environment, and, and natural capital. It needs to work for all three of those. The system is broke because it does not work for all three. Yeah? And that's where I think we need to go to the essence of, uh, of new designing new policies. So, of course, we need to invest because we need to invest in the whole understanding of natural capital. Okay, let's, let's uh, take it from there. You, you stressed the role of language and how we frame this. Thing. You also yeah. said in your presentation about optimism and, and uh, Massimi, I don't know, you talked about the positive and you talked about uh, language, so let's say something about this. Because last week in Sweden, the, one of the most famous authors had a piece in the newspaper and said that the climate again agenda will not only take away all the services and goods that we value, they will take away all of our freedom as well. So the way we frame it, how can we frame it, Massimo? When you listen now to the other presentation, how could we frame this agenda so that it would be this positive vision that you were talking about, but it will still also take the urgency into account. Well, uh, I said uh, uh, during the presentation that again, I was taking a provocative approach in terms of what finance can do. As a matter of fact, over the last 200 years, universities, starting from uh, the MBA Harvard, have been teaching something which is somehow very current with what we do need to do today to make sure that the three yeah. values are addressed. That's why, and taking into account another factor that, of course, banks and financial institutions are immersed in a regulatory framework in which, of course, we have some kind of flexibility, but then those are the boundaries. We do not have to forget that on an annual basis, this world runs on oil because there are 5.3 trillion subsidies to oil and gas every single year, public money. So that's why I was anticipating that we do need a cultural shift. We do need these universities in school. We need to reframe how do we create value. Back in 2010, I don't want to make any sort of publicity, it's a sort of a good action being taken. There is a company which is called Puma. Puma made an interesting exercise. They tried to make sure that we are able to trace down environmental consequences of their actions. Ben, they somehow labeled from zero, from, uh, zero to four the environmental impact. Well, in Germany, well, you come out with the paper bag and your product, the environmental impact is uh, in Australia, where cattle is somehow used 
for the production letter, the impact was four. The CEO, Puma, signed an environmental PNL saying, look, dear shareholders, half of our profit 2010 is due to natural resources. Back 2015, the holding group, trading group, adopted the environmental PNL as a way going forward for that company. What do we need is the recognition that finance does play a role in supporting those kind of actions, but again, we do need a regulatory framework and standards that do need to support these kind of actions. Otherwise, we will still will not be able to somehow distinguish between who is doing greenwashing, who is doing being a very, very sort of green. And that's why in the storytelling, I was anticipating that from my perspective, still talking about sustainability agenda, maybe not being the highest uh, standard of uh, uh, um, success, because many, many people have been talking about this for years. And as Martin Stachy from uh, uh, former McKinsey and now Systemic said, we spent 25 years convincing people to become sustainable. We don't add other 25 years to convince them to become circular. So the narrative is very crucial. We need to understand the cultural conditions within which we are doing uh, our work, and that's why we do command the uh, European Commission uh, um, uh, work, because it's helping us, Europeans, to retreat back what is the concept of being uh, able to reconnect business and society in a way which pertains to the way that European, uh, European ec economy works. We don't have resources. Europe does import six times what is able to export. That's why circular economy is the only way forward for European citizens. Well, you mentioned uh, here uh, Puma is a good example. Lena mentioned a lot of examples. How do we get from these examples to changing the framework conditions so that this what is just an individual example becomes the norm and it changes and it accelerates this, this change. How do we get the, I mean, how do we get the knowledge base from individual companies, from Neste, what are the accelerators? And I know the story of Neste a bit, I mean, where EU policies were also crucial and domestic. But how do we get this to a learning? Is it the role for the new Horizon Europe program or to somehow aggregate? We have all this knowledge floating around, but we are still using on very small pieces. And how do we get that to standardization and things like that? All banks would take things into account that it's not just sort of some experimenting here and there, and that this is based on the knowledge. Any good ideas on that? I think, yeah, um, I think this kind of... Um, about education, but I don't mean education in a conventional meaning. I mean, we need to share, like, speaking the phenomenon. I think that is when we share, we ex when we explain the good cases, when we meet top management, that is some kind of, I mean, we, we might get, bring in some inspiration. But then there's also in education, for example, in universities, in schools, there we, we are develop the next generation of, of experts, but it's also uh, it's about uh, updating our knowledge, uh, up, not updating knowledge of, of experts, and that happens in, not only in in an, in uh, educating events, but but via normal practices, bringing new perspective in when the new decisions are, are are made, taking new perspectives in when 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 making strategies or or uh, technology. Talking narratives, mm. good news stories, mm -hmm. that's clearly one part uh, of it. And, and I would like to uh, highlight that, for example, the language catalyst or, or using language or communication as catalyst doesn't uh, refer only to greenwashing. It's about how to, how to, what kind of words we use. Are they uh, attractive? Are we giving clear instructions how to recycle, for example? So, so, so also language can use uh, to transfer knowledge, and new, new perspectives, new values. Hans, you wanted to? Yeah, I, I agree with all that. And, and often there is a, a focus on uh, education and on changing the language and then on best practices and sharing those in the learning environment. And I'm all for that. But I think we're at a point now where we also need to be more explicit about what we should stop doing, what is blocking us from breaking, why we are not using everything that is out there 
already and why it is not scaling up and speeding up, because those are the two critical terms. Because in 1992, we framed the SDGs, it was called Agenda 21. Yeah? We're now 27 years later, and we're globally less sustainable than we were then. So the real question for me is, that is the, the thing we need to confront. What will we do radically different in the next 11 years, 2030, the SDGs, that we have not done for 27 years? That is where the real questions are and where the real answers will need to come. And we will not solve that by organizing circles that exchange good and best practices. If that is good, if we do not address the real lock-ins, the real issues where the, 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 the blockage in the system is located, and that's not a negative uh, message, it's a fundamental knowledge message. It's a message of logic and of argumentation that we need okay, to Okay, good. We, we, we should take up this challenge. We should really address this, the lock-ins and the things that are blocking us. Arnold, could I ask you, could, could the life programs and uh, uh, Horizon Europe coming up, can they have a role not only in providing information on these new things, but on what is blocking change? Could we have more focus on projects that would be analyzing how to get and good practice in getting rid of bad stuff, the subsidies that were mentioned, or, or but, but many others, other things. Could, could the EU poly, uh, research and development policies have a role here? Uh, of course, and I think uh, already, let's say, the projects, you know, as I mentioned, they work uh, in, in, in the, that direction, but I think the issue that mentioned by, by Hans was more about how we can kind of internalize uh, certain, let's say, uh, aspects uh, I don't know, like maybe CO2 or even in water, let's say, in our economic system, which, of course, then is more up for the regulatory, you know, uh, decisions uh, for the, let's say, regulation. Of course, we will see, let's say, what the new new president, let's say, mm. uh, will, will propose. Um, but again, I think I, I just wanted, if there's still a little bit of time, uh, to touch upon the issue because about the sustainability and, and circularity, because again here I think we should uh, uh, we should uh, consider as well how how let's say we develop this uh, circular economy approach and how we do it let's say uh, proper basically in in addressing you know uh, certain let's say trade-offs in the system, because let's say, if we even uh, increase say, the material efficiency of the uh, products but at the same time let's say uh, we increase the energy consumption or the use of water, you know, again, uh, it could, in certain case, could be a little bit counterproductive. Again, if we have some kind of substances, you know, in the materials uh, that, again, they need to be tackled, let's say, and tracked uh, properly and to remove at the end of life, you know, of the project or during the recycling process, you know, uh, to avoid, again, damaging environment or, let's say, or people, uh, let's say, uh, people health. Uh, another okay, uh, example, it's uh, let's say the how we use the um, circular bioeconomy, you know, because again here let's say uh, we should not only replace fossil material with bio-based material, but what consequence to have on land use, on the organic cycles, in order to, to not to undermine let's say biodiversity. And again, the big issue here is, as well as, uh, again, uh, for, for how it impact people life, how, how this transition will uh, impact, you know, the companies and uh, territorial uh, cohesion. Of course, it's not, not to say about that we should uh, avoid bold action. No, we need a bold action, but again, we need to be kind of smart when we make those uh, bold uh, actions. And here again, I think this, uh, sustainability and sustainable development goal are very good uh, comp for all our activities, you know, in the context of, uh, of the circular, let's say, economy uh, development. But of course, the big amount of the programs uh, that they will, of course, they will continue not to invest, uh, and uh, uh, let's say, in the, both in circular economy as well in the biodiversity, you know, uh, biodiversity strategy, not speaking about the climate, you know, climate change. Okay, good. Lena, you want to also yeah, want to I would like to comment. But uh, Hans said about that there are some gaps in, in progression um, when it comes to experimenting and 
scaling up mm. from, from experimenting. Uh, in, in our study, and, and, and particularly when we have organized in um, our project uh, workshops among industry actors, and we have also discussed that, that uh, in many industries we uh, stay on pilot level. So we are experimenting, we are doing pilots, and then nothing happens. We are not scaling up, mm. we are not using these uh, uh, new practices, we are not implementing them, we are not scaling them up. So there are some kind of piloting loops, and I have discussed with a Dutch colleague, and they, uh, he has uh, identified the similar is happening in, in the Netherlands, the, what I'm talking about is happening in Finland. So, so I think there is some kind of structural um, gap yep. there, how to, to move from piloting to true implementation. It's That's financing not. the key. What, what is the challenge then? <laughs> I mean, I don't have the yeah. clear answer on what the challenge is. Uh, one thing I think that actually transition is going, and we have uh, maybe an overview uh, which is uh, uh, unable to catch what actually is happening across uh, Europe and even other regions. I mean, thinking about China, talking about China, US, and so on. But just to st stick to the, the discussion, um, I mean, we are one of the most sustainable banks globally. That's mm -hmm. why we wanted to make sure that circular for us is not just a matter of greenwash. Of course, environment is crucial, but we want to make sure that we are able to do business with others that are able to become more sustainable. Otherwise, being sustainable and doing business with who is not sustainable. One perhaps of the issue is regulation uh, expectations. I mean, when we do talk about European economy, and at least for Italian ones, we are talking about SMEs. 95% of the economy is done by SMEs. Talking about what they do, usually they are so busy in doing business, they are not able to anticipate expectation in the regulatory framework over the next three, five years. So again, there is an issue that if regulation is changing in a one and I mean particular one as well is changing rapidly and is changing dramatically. There is the possibility that entrepreneurs they may also want to invest, they also have good ideas, but actually there is a sort of vacuum where there is no certainty about what's going to happen in the regulatory framework. This is happening at a level but across regions in Europe as well, at least if there is not a sort of fixed kind of framework within which companies can do take long-term decisions for investments rather than subsidies. We have been talking about, should we incentivize circular economy? Of course we can, but again, I remind myself what's happening in the renewables. As far as you had incentives for renewables, we have been uh, uh, importing panels and we have been uh, producing uh, renewable energy. Once the uh, fiscal stimulus cut off, you basically didn't create any single new job, and it's like new company. You just have technology from Germany, maybe, and uh, panels from China. That's it. And then you had to decommission them. So the issue is, how do we invest in making sure that circular becomes the cultural way for doing business in Europe? And of course, I do believe that circulation of uh, ideas and pilots is crucial, and we are supporting them. But at the same time, regulatory framework is crucial to give entrepreneurs the idea and the stability to invest. All right, we have a few more minutes. I have 10 more teams on my list, but, but let's just continue with this about language and how to really get things going. I have convinced you that after yesterday, I was extremely depressed after listening to the presentation. And it was all about everything in circular economy, so complex, it's so systemic, and we have to optimize it more, and we have to learn a lot more before we do anything. So, Ten years, we will meet again here, and we will see what have we learned, and we will have uh, some more LCDs and uh, some more links uh, visible. Well, then I was thinking, what should be the role of actually acting and urgency, and then learning from one, what we act? And we are always talking about that nothing is happening. But look at one thing that is happening, and we are all, um, or many of us, are really annoyed about it. These are these electric scooters. Half a year ago, nobody, or say one year ago. Uh, Nobody in, in Helsinki and nobody in Lund, nobody had a clue about this. And now they are all over the place. And there are three different companies I saw when I was walking here. And, and, they are, uh, and we are all annoyed by, by it. But is it probably a better source of new knowledge you can learn from this process that we would be planning on different modes of mobility for, for 10 more years and do some then we wouldn't act at all? So how do 
When we act for from and learn something even from the annoying things and still do something different and get rid of something or bad practices instead of just getting depressed of how complex it is. Haas, help me. <laughs> okay, I'm your uh, morning Prozac. That is good. Um, <laughs> and you have two minutes. Yes. So. Well, I, I think we can learn from those cities because mobility, uh, let's look at the urban environment that are far advanced of the others. And, and I know Brussels very well, being Belgian. I live in Copenhagen now, two million people in a big agglomeration, completely different mobility system. Yeah? Quality of life different, quality of the air different. Uh, it has all sorts of positive impacts, habits, uh, values, uh, discourse. It's very different there. So what, what are the fundamentals? It's not only technology, it's governance that's maintained over 20 years. It is infrastructure. It is high-quality alternatives. It is interlinking. It's all the things that people talked about. It's investing in that type of mobility. And of course, there are all experiments that don't work. And that is part of that. But if the broader trajectory is in the right direction, and we know where we want to go, and there is consistency and coherency and engagement and vision that can be well communicated, it's OK to experience go off the rails once in a while. And I think that's where, where I see a huge difference between a city like Copenhagen and a, a city like, like Brussels, where I don't see any of those components uh, strongly uh, and you get completely different outcomes. But it starts with a vision. What is the good life in a city in the 21st century? And how do you try to organize that together? And that's where, that's where it starts. And then you need everything that was discussed. You need investments that are big. You need experiments. You need to understand who is in the ecosystem. You need the right language. You need all of that. But if you don't have a vision of where you want to go, you know, it's going all over the map. And, that, and that clearly doesn't work. The paradigm changes when the old paradigm is dysfunctional. I think it's pretty obvious that the paradigm is broken and that it's dysfunctional. We're moving towards a four-degree world. We have a big extinction and our resource system doesn't work. Uh, what are we waiting for to scale up and speed up what we know is working in places? And that is the real question. What are we waiting for to break through what is locking us into the old system? And it can be finance, it can be technology, it can be markets. A lot of markets are oligarchic. They have a different dynamic than other market systems. It, it can be IT, it can be habits, it can be all sorts of things. We need to understand what it is and then break through it. Was that enough to cheer that, that you up? That was very good. Now we are already in overtime, but since I'm We're chair, I will give, take one or two more minutes. So I I will ask you, Lena, you will go back to Tampa after this mm. with some new ideas. And you know from Hans that the political momentum is there. There's never been in Brussels such a good framework as it is now. So what will you do locally in, in, in uh, what will the advice you will give in Pirkanma so that you will get this uh, catalyzing kicking in and you will take also the opportunity of being in the right time doing this now when the political framework is, is the best it's ever been for it. So what will you take with you from here to become up? Actually, the message that we should continue the, what, what, what is already done in, in Pirkama region, because I think that there is some kind of brainness, brainness uh, in that area in, in, in doing things differently. Many of my examples were from, I mean, the region was involved in that moment. So, so what we need is that we going on the track. Great. I think actually this is also wanted to end that on one hand we have seen from these examples that we, but, but also we heard uh, yesterday I know that there is a lot of interesting things going on locally in different cities, not in all cities like Brussels, but in many cities a lot of good things going on. There is now the, the, the momentum to have a change in the sort of political framework conditions for this so that they can mutually reinforce on it. There is a new thinking among the bankers about finance, about really getting rid of the linear risks. And then we have, and we know that we will have in the future an increased budget for both life and horizon Europe. There will be resources, also European resources, uh, 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 supporting this. 
With that, I hope that we'll all network efficiently during the coffee break, come up with new ideas. We will come back in this room 11 and 15 and continue uh, with a fantastic moderator and chair of the next session because the next session will be chaired by Mr. Hans Brönings. Be back on time. Okay. <laughs>